Now, if I see Steph on, Steph on here, or Stephen on here, oh, bro, we have a problem. If I see the little on the team on here, we have a problem, too, on, on our hands. It was crazy. Like, I was straight crip. Today, I'll be exploring the history of some what? NBA players, particularly those who were former gang members before they started playing on the court. For many of them, basketball was not just a game, but a way out of a dangerous environment. You, you knew what to look out for, you knew what to expect, you knew where to go, where not to go, what this street was, what this street wasn't. So, the caution and the, the survival tactics that you needed to have. James Harden. Growing up and playing basketball in Lakewood, California, Harden was exposed to the influence of the Bloods, a notorious street gang founded in the early 1960s in Los Angeles. The Bloods are infamously known for their efforts to recruit young African Americans into the gang whenever they get the chance. The streets of Lakewood were not easy to navigate, especially for a young talent like Harden. Poverty and danger lurked around every corner. It surprised me that James Harden was ever a part of a game. It surprised me. I never expect Dream Hard to be a part of the game. And the Bloods were a constant presence. It was in this environment that Harden's path intersected with gang culture. During the early part of his career, there were uh -huh. instances where Harden's actions on the court raised suspicions about his affiliation with the Bloods. In a game against the San Antonio Spurs, Harden was seen running up and down the court, throwing up hand signs that made many people think he was claiming to be a Blood. These hand signs, known as gang signs, are one of the ways gang- A for one. You you can't be um doing a game sign and then you are part of a game or or not. You're not then repping no game sign. You can get yourself killed. Gang members identify themselves and communicate with each other. They serve yeah. as a way to show allegiance and loyalty to the gang. For uh, Harden, oh. these signs became a topic of discussion and speculation among fans and the media. The Bloods, like many other gangs, have various indicators that members use to identify themselves. What? These indicators include colors, clothing, symbols, tattoos, no, no. jewelry, We're graffiti, red? language, and you of course, can, hand it. signs. The most Jeez. commonly used symbol associated with the Bloods is the number five, represented by a five-pointed star or crown. These symbols are meant to show the Bloods' affiliation with the People's Nation, a large coalition of gang affiliates created to protect Alliance members within the federal and state prison systems. Gang members often display these symbols through tattoos, jewelry, and clothing as a way to assert their identity and mark their territory. James Harden's association with the Bloods extended beyond the basketball court. He has befriended what? various rappers who have ties to the gang, most notably Lil Wayne. Harden's friendship with Lil Wayne became evident when he sent out a tweet inviting the rapper to the next gang game, saying, come to the next game, we got seats 45. In addition to this, there are more speculations that Harden's has some connection to the YSL gang. It all started when an old tweet from Harden resurfaced, in which he claimed to be a member of the YSL gang. While some dismissed it as a joke or a playful statement, others began to question the validity of his claim. The tweet, which tweet which was originally posted years ago caught the attention of fans and followers who were quick to share it across various social media platforms. What type of tweet? Yeah, Harden I sin. Yeah, like, I never expect Harden to be part of a big issue game like the blood. As the tweet gained traction, people started to speculate about the extent of Harden's involvement with the YSL gang and whether what? there was any truth behind his claim. The controversy surrounding Harden's alleged affiliation with the YSL gang intensified when fans and followers began tagging law enforcement agencies, urging them to investigate and arrest the NBA star. Social media became flooded with comments and memes, with some users even calling for the NBA to suspend Harden what? until the allegations were resolved. Marcus Daniels. Marquis Daniels was born and raised in the tough neighborhoods of Orlando. Jump down in the comment and tell me, who is Mark Danielson? I, I never heard about no Mark Danielson. Wait, do y'all know who Mark Danielson is? Orlando, Florida. He faced numerous challenges and temptations growing up. While he has never formally admitted to being in a gang, there are numerous yeah? pictures on the internet wow. holding a red bandana and throwing up blood signs, uh, indicating wait. a possible affiliation with the notorious oh, blood gang. So, but so, it doesn't so you stop. Me, we got two people who are involved with the blood. We got Harlan, blood. Then Mark Danston, blood. Wow. There. Another peculiar detail about Daniels is his refusal to write the letter C 
Instead, he replaces it with K's, a practice commonly associated with the Blood Gang. This linguistic choice has only added fuel to the fire, leaving fans and critics wondering about the true nature of his connections. Growing up, Daniels had to navigate through a world filled with violence and crime. Gangs were a prevalent presence live, in his too. neighborhood, and it was not uncommon live, to witness drug deals and shootings on a regular basis. Despite the chaos around him, Daniels found solace and escape in the game of basketball. He honed his skills on the local courts, using the sport as a means to stay focused and avoid the pitfalls of the streets. As Daniels continued to excel on the basketball court, his talent caught the attention of college recruiters. He received a scholarship to Auburn University, where he showcased his skills and proved that he had what it takes to compete at the collegiate level. Despite the adversity he faced, Daniels managed to secure a spot in the NBA, signing with the Dallas Mavericks in 2003. Throughout his career, he played for several teams, including the Indiana Pacers, Boston Celtics, and Milwaukee Bucks. Known for his versatility and defensive prowess, Daniels carved out a solid career for himself in the league. Daniels' NBA career was marked by ups and downs, but he managed to carve out a solid career for himself. Known for his versatility and defensive prowess, he became a valuable asset to the teams he played for. However, his past affiliations with the Blood Gang continued to haunt him. Throughout his career, Daniels faced scrutiny and criticism for his possible gang ties. The media Wait. often questioned his character and integrity, painting him as a troubled player. Despite the negative attention, Daniels remained focused on the game and used his platform to inspire others who may have come from similar backgrounds. Off the court, Daniels has been actively involved in community outreach programs, using his own experiences. Well, that's nice. One minute later. Damar attended his first funeral. It was a somber event, a farewell to his uncle Kevin, who had been brutally murdered by a rival gang member. Kevin was known as one of the biggest Crips in Compton, and his death served as Damar's introduction to the harsh realities of gang life. It was a wake-up call that would shape his future. Although the dangers wow. of the neighborhood were ever-present, his, his talent made all the made thugs, all thugs in the neighborhood protect, protect the, the young athlete, athlete, athlete and his remaining family members. members. Constantly cheering and encouraging him to get better, the neighborhood saw in DeRozan uh -huh. a glimmer of hope and a way out of the cycle of violence and crime. Basketball became his escape, his ticket to a better life. It was during this time that DeRozan's affiliation with the Crips, a notorious street gang became apparent. The Crips, a gang based in the coastal regions of Southern California, were founded in Los Angeles in 1960. Isn't the Crips in more, more, got like more gang in the uh, Bloods? Like isn't the Crips the bigger gang in the Bloods? Look, look, look that up. I want, I want to know. All right, good. I want. I want to know. I want to ask him though. Groups in the blood used to be being found in Los Angeles, California, have been in gang wars since the uh, 1970s. The war is made up. A smaller local campaign and both games have mostly taken place in major. Uh, let's go to the trips. Oh, oh, so Chris are the power from the blend. It's a, it's a larger due to their large size, greater number of members, and stronger ties to organization crime who is more powerful, drugs or trips. Nobody will ever answer you correctly. So basically, the Chris are more big, bigger than the blood, but nobody will answer that question who the um, biggest one. Wow. Members of the Crips traditionally wear blue, and they are one of the largest yeah. and most violent associations of street gangs in the United States. With an estimated 30,000 to 35,000 members in 2008, <clears throat> like they have been involved in 30, murders, 000, robberies, 35, drug dealing, and members? other crimes. In Damn. 2010, DeRozan took to Twitter and tweeted out the hashtag, In high school, I wore blue every day. This tweet shed light on his affiliation with the Crips and the influence the gang had on his life. It was a bold statement, a way for DeRozan to show pride in Why his roots DeRozan. and the journey he had taken 
Morgan to overcome the to overcome the challenges of his environment. Sadly, Demar has several traumas associated with said roots. One heavy one happened in the middle of Wait. his senior year when he lost his best friend, Davian Giles. Davian was shot and killed in a dispute over a dice game. The loss of his friend weighed heavily on him and he couldn't bring himself to attend the funeral. In an interview, he said, at a young age, I lost one of my best friends to gang violence. I lost a lot of people before I even graduated high school. You're talking about sitting next to somebody in class on a Monday and Monday night. That was the last time they'd ever be seen. Come back to school Tuesday and their stuff is still on their desk. Things like that consistently happened. Javaris Crittenton, Javaris Crittenton's basketball journey began in Atlanta, Georgia, where he showcased his skills at Southwest Atlanta Christian Academy. His talent and potential caught the attention of college recruiters, and he eventually committed to play for the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. During his time... Do y'all know about him? Because I don't, I don't keep up with, like, the old, old basketball player that retired and stuff. So I don't really know, know about him. At Georgia Tech, Crittenton displayed flashes of brilliance, earning him a reputation as a rising star in the basketball world. Born on December 31, 1987, in Atlanta, Georgia, Crittenton was a standout basketball player in high school and college. In 2007, Crittenton declared for the NBA draft and was selected by the Los Angeles Lakers in the first round. His dreams of NBA stardom seemed within reach, but little did he know that his life would take a dark turn. While playing Boy. for the Lakers, Crittenton's involvement with the Mansfield Gangster Crips a notorious street gang became apparent. He had joined the gang after entering the NBA, seeking a sense of belonging and- So you tell me you joined the gang after entering to the NBA? How dumb are you? That's the dumbest thing. Like, really, you have from Harden to Rosen, you got Mark and something. Like, they joined the gang before before they join the NBA, not after they join the NBA. Stupid. Later that day. This affiliation would prove to be his downfall. In 2011, Crittenton's life took a tragic turn when he was charged with the murder of a 22-year-old mother. The now, see, see, this is the reason why, why, why you should not be in the game. Why would you go and be in the game after joining the NBA? How dumb you look. Wait, well, wait, look at that face. You look like a steel uh, right now. You, you stupid. The incident occurred during a drive-by shooting in Atlanta, and Crittenton was accused of being the trigger man. Alongside him, his cousin Douglas Gamble faced the same charges, and both were scheduled to stand trial on the same day. The gang-related charges carry significant weight in Crittenton's trial. If convicted of these offenses, he could face an additional 15 years in prison on top of the potential life sentence for murder. The prosecution will do everything in their power to prove Crittenton's gang affiliation and use it to secure a conviction. Crittenton's defense attorney, Brian Steele, declined interviews and did not allow his client to make any public comments. As the legal proceedings unfolded, more details emerged about Crittenton's involvement in criminal activities. It was revealed that he had become deeply entangled in a life of crime, participating in drug trafficking and other illicit activities. His association with the Mansfield gangster group further solidified his reputation right as a player with a troubled past. In 2013, Crittenton was indicted on numerous charges, including attempted murder and Damn, participating in criminal street activity. The jury weighed the evidence presented by both sides and decided whether Crittenton's alleged gang ties were enough to convict him. The outcome of this trial will have far-reaching implications for Crittenton's future. Regardless of the trial's outcome, Crittenton's reputation has already been tarnished. The once promising NBA career was now overshadowed by the dark cloud of criminal charges. Zach Randolph. Zach Randolph, a veteran player in the NBA, has been remarkably candid about his experiences with crime. Before his successful basketball career, Randolph found himself on the wrong side of the law, with arrests for robbery and battery. His journey into the world of basketball and gangsterism began in Marion, Indiana, a town with a troubled past. Marion was once a safe haven for blacks in the North before the Civil War, where a mutual harmony existed between the black and white populations. However, this harmony was shattered in the 1920s when the Ku Klux Klan infiltrated the area, leaving a lasting impact on the community. As the years passed, Zach's basketball talent began to shine. Despite his troubled background, his skills on the court were undeniable. However, his off-court choices often landed him in trouble with the law. One Boy. incident occurred when he was just 15 years old. Authorities placed Zach under house arrest for battery, a charge that would further complicate his path to success. Zach Randolph's entry into the NBA marked a turning point in his life, but it also- so, so he, he only got arrested for a battery arm? Or battery arm? 
wait, wait, whatever it is. As a member Boy. of the Portland Trail Blazers, Zach found himself amidst the notorious Jail Blazers era, a period marked by off-court troubles and a tarnished reputation. In 2002, just two years into his NBA career, Zach faced his first major legal issue. He was arrested for underage drinking, a charge that further added to the growing concerns surrounding his behavior. This incident was just the beginning of a string of off-court troubles that would plague him throughout his time in Portland. In 2009, Zach's time with the Portland Trail Blazers came to an end when he was traded to the Memphis Grizzlies. The move to Memphis proved to be a turning point for Zach, both on and off the court. He quickly became the face of the franchise and a beloved figure in the city. In Memphis, he seemed to fit in naturally, and many mistakenly believed that he was born there. However, trouble always seemed to be just a step away from Zach. In 2010, a longtime friend of his was arrested with a cooler full of marijuana while driving Zach's car. This incident once again raised questions about Zach's 2017, a night that would once again put Zach in the spotlight for all the wrong reasons. Another he was time. hanging out in the Nickerson Gardens projects in Los Angeles, a notorious area controlled by the bounty hunter Bloods. Officers observed a large crowd, including Zach, drinking, smoking marijuana, playing loud music, and blocking the road. When the officers attempted to detain another man, the growing crowd became agitated and surrounded them. Police units and sheriff deputies had to respond to disperse the crowd. Zach was arrested on suspicion of possession of marijuana for sale and held on a $20,000 bond. This incident once again brought attention to his troubled past and raised questions about his involvement with gangs and criminal activities. Alan, see, this is a messed up. Now he messed up his career. The other two messed up his career by joining the game after he joined the NBA. I'm glad like Horn and DeRozan as he got away from the game found. Alan Iverson. Allen Iverson's journey to basketball greatness began with a deep love for football. He grew up in a tough neighborhood in Hampton, Virginia, and he found solace and passion on the football field. His incredible speed, agility, and natural athleticism made him a standout player, catching the attention of coaches and scouts. But fate had other plans for Iverson. As he entered high school, he faced a difficult decision to continue pursuing football or explore a new path in basketball. Despite his success on the gridiron, Iverson couldn't ignore the allure of the hardwood. With his heart set on a new New challenge, Iverson made the bold choice to transition from football to basketball. It was a decision that would shape the course of his life and ultimately lead him to basketball stardom. Iverson's transition to basketball was not without its hurdles. As a relatively small player, standing at just six feet tall, he faced skepticism and doubt from those who believed his size would limit his potential. But Iverson was determined to prove them wrong. He poured his heart and soul into the game, honing his skills and developing a unique playing style that would set him apart from his peers. Iverson lightning fast crossovers, explosive drives to the basket, and fearless finishes at the rim became his trademarks, captivating audiences and leaving defenders in awe. In 1993, at the age of 17, Iverson and a group of friends were involved in a fight at a bowling alley in Hampton, Virginia. The incident resulted in Iverson's arrest and subsequent legal proceedings. The media scrutiny surrounding the incident was intense, painting Iverson as a troublemaker and reinforcing stereotypes about athletes from disadvantaged backgrounds. Despite maintaining his innocence, Iverson faced an uphill battle to clear his name and prove that he was more than the negative headlines. In a bid to channel his frustrations and emotions into something positive, the court became his space where he could showcase his immense talent and rise above the challenges he faced. This dedication to the sport and his unwavering commitment to his craft began to pay off. He caught the attention of college recruiters and earned a scholarship to Georgetown University, where he would continue to make headlines both on and off the court. One of the most prominent allegations against Iverson was his support supposed affiliation with a notorious street gang known as the Goon Squad. According to various reports, Iverson was believed to have strong ties to this gang, participating in criminal activities and using his fame and fortune to fund their operations. Law enforcement agencies and investigative journalists thoroughly scrutinized the allegations against Iverson, but no concrete evidence linking him to any gang-related activities was ever found. In fact, Iverson's Boy. legal record remained relatively clean throughout his career, with no convictions or charges related to gang involvement. Wow. Another aspect that fueled the rumors surrounding Iverson was his unapologetic and rebellious image. His tattoos, flashy jewelry, and confrontation- Oh, so, it like the tattoo that he had, the jewelry, and his flashy confidence. That would, would like, make it seem like he asked you a part of a game or even something. Hmm. 
attitude on and off the court contributed to the perception that he was involved in illicit activities. However, appearances can be deceiving, and personal style does not equate to criminal behavior. Stephen Jackson Stephen Jackson was born on April 5, 1978 in Port Jackson? Arthur, Texas. Growing up in a tough neighborhood, he was exposed to the harsh realities of street life from an early age. Poverty, violence, and the allure of gang culture were all too familiar in his surroundings. Crazy. At a young age, Jackson Dancing. found solace in basketball. It became NBA his escape player. from the challenges of his oh, environment. Jill. But even on That's the court, crazy. the influence of nah. the street... Now, if I see Steph on, Steph on here, or Stephen on here, oh, bro, you have a problem. If I see a little pawn on the team on here, we have a problem too on, on our hand. Off the court, he often wore a red bandana, yeah, a symbol of his allegiance to the gang. Mellon While he distanced too. himself from engaging in gang activities, like the association was deeply ingrained in his identity. It was a reflection of the environment he grew up in and the people he surrounded himself with. Jackson's older brother, Donald Buckner, was beaten to death when he was just 15 years old. This devastating loss had a profound impact on him, further solidifying his determination to rise above the circumstances and make a better life for himself. Why, why would someone do that? Why would someone go and beat somebody to death until they die? Why would do that? Basketball became Jackson's saving grace. Through sheer talent and relentless dedication, he honed his skills on the court, catching the attention of college recruiters. Jackson's talent led him to Butler Community College in Kansas, where he continued to excel on the basketball court. His skills and determination caught the eye of NBA scouts, paving the way for his professional career. In the 1997 NBA draft, Stephen Jackson was selected by the Phoenix Suns in the second round. Throughout his NBA career, Jackson faced scrutiny and judgment due to his association uh -huh. with the Blood Street oh. Gang. The media often focused on this aspect of his life, overshadowing his accomplishments on the court. Throughout his NBA career, Jackson faced an internal struggle. On one hand, he wanted to distance himself from his troubled past and be seen as a respected athlete. On the other hand, the loyalty he felt towards his former gang members and the challenges he faced in breaking free from their influence continued to haunt him. In 2018, tragedy struck when Jackson's close friend and fellow rapper, PNB Rock, was shot and killed in a gang-related incident. This devastating event shook Jackson to his core and forced him to confront the harsh realities of the world he had once been a part of. In a surprising turn of events, Jackson publicly announced that he would check in with gang members to ensure their well-being and try to prevent further violence. Why were you going to check on them? Bro, if your PBN rock was still alive, you will tell you... Stop it. Get some help. In his words, everywhere I go, I call somebody from the place I'm going that I know and check in. I want to come home to my family and I love my life. I'm checking in with my people out of respect. There's nothing wrong with showing respect when you in somebody's city or state. I always check in because I know real ones everywhere. I care about my life and I'm coming home to my kids and my family. Bet that. This decision sparked a heated debate with some praising his efforts to make a positive impact while others questioned the potential dangers and implications of his involvement. J.R. Smith Smith. On December 16, 2006, during a game against the Denver Nuggets, Smith found himself at the center of a brawl. After a hard foul from Marty Collins, Smith's violent reaction ignited a chaotic scene that resulted in multiple suspensions, including a 10-game ban for Smith himself. This incident, though technically on the court, foreshadowed the turbulent journey that awaited him off the court. Just a few months later, on February 7, 2007, Smith and his teammate Carmelo Anthony were involved in a minor car accident. While accidents happen, this incident took a dark turn as it caused both players to miss. Shoot around before a game against the Portland Trailblazers. Smith was driving one of Anthony's cars when the fender bender occurred, raising eyebrows and questions about their judgment and responsibility. Little did anyone know that tragedy was lurking around the corner. On June 9, 2007, Smith's life took a devastating turn. He was driving an SUV that ran a stop sign, resulting in a collision with another vehicle that flipped his SUV over. Miraculously, Smith escaped serious injury, but the same couldn't be said for his passenger and close friend Andre Bell. Bell suffered severe head injuries in the wreck and tragically passed away two days later. This incident was not just another antic. It was a heart-wrenching tragedy that would haunt Smith for- See, now it show you what what happened when you were in that role. Even if JR didn't do it, now I can you gotta pay attention when you're on that role. You don't know what might happen. And what, what happened if you, if that happened, that was you. 
Everybody in the NBA career will be skeptical. Man, bro, ain't no way we lost an NBA player that quick. For years to come, as the dust settled, it became clear that Smith's driving record was far from exemplary. Reports revealed that he had accumulated 27 points against his license from April 22, 2005 to Get January 10, 2006, with eight violations on seven different dates, five of which were for speed. Shockingly, wow. despite these violations, Smith's license was technically in good standing at the time of the crash. The aftermath of the accident included a 90-day jail sentence for Smith, who managed to avoid a more serious felony charge. He served 24 days in jail, agreed to perform uh -huh. 500 hours of community service, and faced a seven-game suspension from the NBA. But Smith's troubles didn't end there. On October 13, 2007, just a few months after the tragic accident, he found himself embroiled in yet another controversy. Allegedly involved in a fight outside a Denver nightclub, Smith's behavior continued to raise eyebrows and cast a shadow over his career. The Denver Nuggets suspended him for three games, further tarnishing his reputation. J.R. Smith, since entering the NBA in 2004 has been one of the most exciting and controversial players in the league. While known for his on-court antics and flashy style of play, Smith's involvement with gang culture has raised eyebrows and sparked controversy. After serving his jail sentence in 2009, Smith returned to the NBA with a cloud of controversy hanging over him. It didn't take long for him to find himself in hot water once again, but this time it was on the digital front. Smith's ill-advised use of Twitter became a source of concern for fans and the league alike. In a series of tweets, he caught the attention of followers who noticed that he was replacing C's with K's, a practice commonly associated with the Bloods gang. Speculation about Smith's associations ran rampant, and his social media activity raised eyebrows. In response to the mounting controversy, Smith abruptly shut down his Twitter account. But this was far from his last misstep in the world of social media. Carmelo Anthony Carmelo Anthony, born on May 29, 1984, in Brooklyn, New York, had a challenging upbringing. At the age of eight, his family moved to Baltimore, Maryland, where he was exposed to the harsh realities of inner city life. Growing up in the troubled neighborhood of West Baltimore, Carmelo was surrounded by crime, drugs, and gang violence. These notorious elements had a profound impact on young Melo, who found himself at a crossroads between the streets and his passion for basketball. As a child, Carmelo showed I immense- I know how you find these type of video. It is crazy. It's like, it's like we, we have like four, four NBA players I know. Mark DeRozan, Jay Horn, you got J.R. Smith, then you got Carmel Empty. Like, bro, no way Empty will play the game. His talent on the basketball court. He would spend hours honing his skills, dribbling and shooting on the local playgrounds. However, the allure of the streets and the sense of belonging they offered were hard to resist. In an interview with comedian Kevin Hart on the Gold Mines podcast, Carmelo revealed his teenage struggles and how basketball was not always a priority for him. At the age of 14, Anthony's life changed forever when he joined the notorious gang known as the Harlem Boys. This gang, known for its involvement in drug trafficking and violent crimes, had a strong presence in Anthony's neighborhood. For a young boy seeking a sense of belonging and protection, Action, joining the gang seemed like the only option. The Harlem boys became Anthony's surrogate family, providing him with a sense of camaraderie and support that he had never experienced before. But with this newfound sense of belonging came a dangerous lifestyle. Anthony quickly became immersed in the gang's activities, participating in drug deals, robberies, and acts of violence. As wow. Anthony's reputation within the gang grew, so did his involvement in criminal activities. He became known for his quick temper and willingness to engage in confrontations. The streets became his battleground, and he earned a reputation as a formidable force to be reckoned with. But as Anthony's involvement in the gang escalated, so did the risks. He found himself entangled in a web of violence and crime, constantly looking over his shoulder and living in fear of retaliation. The once promising young athlete was now on a dangerous path that seemed to have no way out. I was probably 12 to 15 when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Basketball was, I've played football, baseball, I've played everything, but I wasn't really serious about nothing. I did not quit, but I stopped going to school after that because I'm like, I didn't come here to play JV, I don't care about this. I wanted to be on the streets, I wanted to run the streets. I'm from Baltimore, so basketball wasn't really important. So you tell me this game finally got your head screw up and you screw up from playing any sports at that age? Wow. Come on, Anthony. 
important for me at that time. Carmelo started losing friends, witnessing violence, and experiencing the devastating consequences of gang activity. These experiences served as a wake-up call for him, prompting him to reevaluate his choices. Basketball became his golden ticket out of the streets, a way to escape the cycle of violence and create a better future for himself. Then my sophomore year came. I started losing friends, people started dying around me, and I saw a whole bunch of things started to happen. Life started to happen, and I had to make a decision about what I wanted to do. So, basketball became that golden ticket. Paul Pierce. Paul Pierce was born and raised no in way, Oakland, Pierce California, a city list. known for its high crime Ain't rates no and gang activity. Wait, Later, his family here. moved to Englewood, California, where he attended Englewood High School. It was during his time in these neighborhoods that Pierce's path intersected with the dangerous world of gangs. On November 25th, 2000, Pierce's life took a dramatic turn when he was stabbed 11 times in the face, neck, and back. Oh, the incident occurred at- You got stabbed 11 times and a couple of them stabbed in the face? Oh, see, I'm crab. I'm in, in the stubborn, not in the that part or something like that. If I was, well, I don't know if I, I probably would live today. I don't even know if I would be here today. The nightclub in Boston's theater district called the Buzz Club. Witnesses reported that Pierce was attempting to separate fighters when he was attacked. The stabbing was a life-threatening event that could have ended Pierce's career and even his life. He had to undergo lung surgery to repair the damage caused by the attack. It was a traumatic experience that left him feeling trapped and vulnerable. After almost losing his life, Pierce displayed incredible resilience and determination. He defied the odds by playing all 82 games the following season, showcasing Damn. his unwavering commitment to the game he loved. The basketball court became a sanctuary for Pierce, a place where he could escape the pressures and dangers of the outside world. In the aftermath of the stabbing, Pierce faced ongoing threats and paranoia. He revealed that he didn't want to go anywhere and had police stationed in front of his house for months. The wow. incident had a profound impact on his mental and emotional well-being, leaving him feeling scared and vulnerable. During the 2008 NBA championship run with the Boston Celtics, Pierce found himself in another controversial situation. In a game, he flashed a gang sign at Al Horford, which caught the attention of the commissioner. The NBA fined Pierce $25,000 for the gang-affiliated gesture. When you play basketball or any type of sport, never, ever, I mean, I'm seriously saying, never, ever, I mean, ever, for any type of gang sign. You don't do that when you play a, on a team. Some fans defended Pierce, claiming that the gesture was misunderstood and that he was simply showing love for his team and the city of Boston. Yeah, I'm not sure they enough. argued that it had nothing to do with gangs and that the media was blowing the situation out of proportion. However, others criticized him, believing that his actions were promoting gang culture and setting a bad example for young fans. Despite the challenges he faced, Pierce used his platform to make a positive impact and strive to stop gangs. Gang violence. He became an advocate for helping inner city youth and worked to provide opportunities for them to escape the cycle of violence and crime. In his retirement, Pierce has dedicated himself to mentoring young athletes and guiding them away from the dangers of gang culture. He